Good afternoon. My name is Sally Berkery and I'm the Managing Director of CEW UK. As sponsors of the CEW Responsible Beauty Award, Shiverdan aims to encourage businesses to identify ways of integrating all aspects of sustainability into their day-to-day -day operations. And today we are delighted to welcome you for Shiverdan's second CEW seminar on sustainability, this time with a focus on social responsibility. We have an amazing lineup of inspiring speakers for you today. And I'm now going to hand you over to Maxine Cannon, who is Global Account Director for Giverdan Active Beauty and also a CW board member to introduce them. Over to you, Maxine. Yes, thank you, Sally. So as Sally said, uh, we'd like to welcome you uh, to this uh, seminar. And uh, as Giverdan is the sponsor of the CW Responsible Beauty Award, it is our aim to encourage as much as possible companies to fulfill their steps in sustainability. So we do have a great lineup of speakers for you today. And if anyone hears anything today that inspires you to take action in your lives, then our mission is accomplished. So from the top, you will be hearing from our global head of sustainability at Shivadan Halvard Brims on beautiful journeys and how sustainability stories shape our future. He will be followed by Professor Helen Storey, talking about her work in the Satari refugee camp in Jordan, sponsored by the Givadan Foundation. Then comes Lee Mann, head of community fair trade at The Body Shop, who will talk about the business being a force for good. And next we have Natalie Deacon, Head of Sustainability and Corporate Affairs for Avon. She will talk about Avon's attempts to close the inequality gap. And finally, and by no means least, following their success of winning this year's Responsible Beauty Award, Joe Chigley, co-founder from Beauty Kitchen, will speak about entrepreneurial spirit and collaboration and how this will change and make life more socially responsible. At the end of these presentations, we would like to encourage you to ask questions and join in, but please don't put the questions in the chat. Please put them in the Q&A, and then I will put them to the panelists. So without further ado, I shall hand you over to Harvard. Thank you, Maxine, and good afternoon, everyone. So sustainability and social responsibility has never been higher on the global agenda. And it's vital that businesses across the globe work together to contribute to a more inclusive and equitable society. This is our responsibility to step up because businesses can step up and they must become force for good. It is a definition of responsibility when you think about it. It's the ability to respond. Social responsibility is not at all a destination. Social responsibility consists of beautiful journeys across many dimensions, places, and time. It takes enormous efforts and focus to shape these journeys we can all be proud of. But staying on the path is the most difficult part. Givaudan has been operating for more than 250 years. And since then, we have worked to have positive impact, always with an eye to the future enriching the world of sense and taste. But as we are now in 2021 and almost in 2022, and as we look into the future of our planet and society, we hear so many negative conversations that surround it. We can be tempted to lose hope. We can be tempted to really lose face in front of all these challenges, all these fears and problems. But we have a responsibility to approach the future in the right way. And approaching it right means imagining and creating a future we can be positive about. We believe that future is worth being positive about. And the responsibility we owe to our society and future generations is to step up and do whatever it takes, whatever we can today to address these challenges like climate change or rising inequalities. It always starts by being clear on why do we do the things we do and also understanding fully the impact we are having as businesses. So we can imagine new business opportunities to accelerate change and drive more positive outcomes. In Givaudan, we know why we do the things we do. It's 
written black and white in our purpose. We are creating for happier, healthier lives with love for nature. And it's an invitation to imagine together the future. This is our purpose and guiding star. It's our commitment to always respond, always go the extra mile to use our business as a force for good. So let me share a few examples on the beautiful journeys we have taken on social responsibility and highlighting how we work with others to stay on the path. Indeed, in Givaudan, in the way we operate and create, we are touching millions of lives every day and everywhere. There are four key areas where we have decided to really accelerate change to drive more positive impact. It's with our creations, it's about the way we care about nature, our people, and caring about communities. Our creations are sparking happiness and delight, and they are bringing so much emotional benefits and improving well being around the globe. And we create all of this with beautiful ingredients. And many of them are iconic natural raw materials and extracts growing in beautiful places that need to be preserved and nurtured. That's why we have shaped beautiful journeys of responsible growth, setting very bold ambitions to show our love for nature in everything we do. For example, by, by becoming a climate positive company across our supply chain, whilst doubling our ability to put on market and work with our customers to deliver products that contribute to more happier and healthier lives. This is why we have very strong targets that are inclusive, that are time bound, that are measurable and also publicly disclosed. This help us be keeping track on progress, but also to stay accountable for not only the delivery of promises, but that ensuring that every day we do the right things. Our engagement in social responsibility is crystal clear for our people as well on our site, because this is what we owe to them. At Givaudan, we nurture a place where we all love to be and grow. And to do this, we address all dimensions related to caring about our people. First, we want to be to ensure that everyone feels welcomed, valued and inspired. And that, this is why we have very strong diversity and inclusion approaches transparent rewards and recognition schemes. This drives a more balanced gender equality when it comes to our senior leadership roles in, across the teams, and also better reflecting the geographical distribution of in the, the way we operate in our markets. So we also drive and ensure that 50% uh, of our senior leaders will be from high growth markets in the future. This is a very pragmatic move to ensure we bring more inclusivity in our approach. We also care a lot for our employees' health and well-being by excelling our safety culture, for example, reducing number of accidents. We have already done magnificent improvements here by reducing events that could cause harm. But we are progressing to the next level now by engaging in more activities around mental health and physical health initiatives to ensure that everyone feels at home. We build leadership skills and expertise we, to anticipate what we will need in the future, to attract the workforce for the future, ensuring that everyone is developing in our organization. And that's why we have very strong programs in uh, leadership and skills development in Givaudan. At all levels of the organization, it's very important. So for this journey, we have been very, very clear about what it means, respect of human rights, and what it means on a day-to-day -day basis. And by being externally audited and running anonymous engagement survey, for example, we ensure that everyone's voice is heard and we stay on the path. Our engagement in social responsibility also expands to the communities where we source and operate. And to do that, we have strengthened our responsible sourcing approach with our program called Sourcing for Good because we foster very high standards in safety, health, social, environment, and business integrity across our entire supply chain, like here in our Jasmine fields in India. As we source 16,000 raw materials, just imagine the scalability and the positive impact and opportunity for better livelihoods we are generating by working with our suppliers, our customers, and engaging with smallholders. We also empower our communities to create connected communities and develop 
better solutions and sustainable solutions together with others to contribute to happier, healthier lives. So we can really leverage the power of the Gilles business. One of few, a few examples that we, during the COVID crisis, in the, early on in the beginning, we established a community fund to support the local communities that has been most uh, affected uh, by the COVID crisis. And since then, we're providing additional targeted support for countries mostly uh, most severely impacted. And through the foundation, uh, the Givaudan Foundation, we enable and support employee-driven projects and volunteering programs. We stay on the path by being externally audited and to ensure that our actions are effective in improving the lives of millions of people in the communities where we source and operate. So as you can see, by understanding how we impact our world, enables us to create these opportunities and fully leverage our ability to respond. Guided by our purpose, we are indeed touching millions of lives every day and everywhere. And to hold ourselves accountable in living our purpose every day, ensuring we stay on the path, we have engaged into one of the most beautiful journey we have uh, encountered yet. It's the one to become a certified B Corp company. So next time you buy and use a beauty product, next time you develop a new one with your teams, next time you envisage a new business opportunity, just think about the beautiful journeys you can or will further contribute to. Explore these opportunities with and engage with others who share the passion on sustainability and ignite the passion in others who may think it's too late to act. You have the ability to respond to that. It is your social responsibility. Hello, everyone, and thanks for inviting me also to talk about what it means at the body shop as a business as uh, a force for good. Um, I've been in the beauty industry for around 35 years, working for some of the biggest global uh, beauty companies. And I've actually been at Body Shop for about um, 24 years now. Um, and in my current role, I'm the head of the Community Fair Trade Programme. Um, and if, you, if you're not aware, the Body Shop is part of Natura & Co. So we are um, uh, four sister brands, Natura, The Body Shop, Aesop and Avon, um, all four of us um, really committed to seeing a better future for, for everybody. And we are the world's largest B Corp um, company. Next slide, please. Most people know me that I'm not a big fan of quotes, but I've got a couple actually in this presentation and both by our Body Shop founder, Anita Roddick. And I'm just going to read this first one, which is, says, in terms of power and influence, you can forget the church, you can forget politics. There is no more powerful institution in society than business. I believe it's now more important than ever before for business to assume a moral leadership. The business of business should not be about money. It should be about responsibility. It should be about public good and not private greed. And now the Body Shop is sort of a, a forerunner of CSR initiatives. We've always been known for our ethics and values. And, you know, Anita said this in the year 2000, and I, I still wonder what's really changed. And what I am uh, and seeing now, I think, is, is much more of a collaborative approach, which I think is essential if we really want to fix this broken world that we, we're living in currently. And we've always been famous for this, right? So, you know, way right back our first activist campaign with Greenpeace and Save the Whales, launching um, the big issue in the UK, uh, animal testing against um, uh, uh, for cosmetics purposes um, on a global scale. It's always been something that we do and we believe in. Um, and so I'm really pleased to be able to share a little bit about what that means when we talk about supply chains. So next slide, please. And the last um, quote I'm going to use is, is, is also Anita, and she sort of sits on my shoulder and she reminds me a little bit of who, who you know, as you're making decisions in business and you're making decisions that will affect your customers, your colleagues, um, your profitability, whatever that looks like. But don't forget to hear the voice of the farmer in everything that you do, because if you don't hear that voice, then what you do is wrong, because we are all representing them too, and they are a huge part of our company. Um, and so we must consider their perspective in those decisions that we're making. Next slide, please. So what is community fair trade? So 
Uh, first and foremost, it's our bespoke fair trade program. You know, we launched um, it back in the 1980s, pioneers of fair trade really as a movement, as a global movement, um, and especially within the cosmetics and, uh, um, and toiletry sector. Uh, it's independently verified as well by um, a group called EcoCert that I'm sure many of you are aware of. Uh, so it's not just us saying that, they keep us um, on top of, of things to make sure that we're always doing what we say that we're doing. Um, and, you know, we know the relationships with our partners around the world. This is a really key part of it. If you look at the people in these images, they're all um, artisans, farmers, wild collectors, people engaged in body shop trade. This is um, uh, definitely a two-way relationship. This is so important. And, uh, and again, you know, because it's our program and we don't uh, farm it out for other people to manage for us, we can have those direct relationships with those organizations and those companies that we work with. And our job really as a community fair trade team is to foster and mentor community-based businesses so that they can become financially viable and sustainable in their own right um, to provide uh, through trade agency so um, they can continue to flourish um, and see a destiny that they want to see for themselves whether that's supporting their journeys on political um, activism whether it's gender equality issues whether it's um, allowing them to uh, put children in schools using the profits and fair pro trade incomes etc um, it's, it's, it's their uh, future and it's just trade that allows that to happen. Um, and it gives us an opportunity as a company to really tell these stories authentically to our customers. When we share the stories with people behind the product, I think there's a real power in that connection, you know, connecting customers to producers. Um, I think that's really important. You know, what I see these days is it's not just enough for people to know where their things come from. People really want to understand how it got to them too. And I think a program like Community Fair Trade allows us to share those those stories directly with our customers and I do it vice versa too it's always quite interesting to show what does a body shop product or a store or a body shop customer look like for our producers so it's a global program um, as you can see here with this um, map and the majority of people um, working are women you know and I think this is really exciting to see and some of the change I've seen over over these um, couple of decades of working in this sphere is that more and more women are taking charge of livelihood creation in farming concepts for instance in our tea tree um, uh, oil in Kenya we're seeing many more women come uh, to the forefront in terms of taking over those 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 farming activities, um, and it's really encouraging to see um, that progression. And we started back in 1987 with a group in South India, and we're still working with that group today. And I think this is a really important part of when you talk about impact. It has to be with the right partners. It has to be someone that you share your goals and vision with, because, you know, we don't necessarily see many business relationships last 35 years. We don't see many personal relationships last that long sometimes too. But I think this is a really um, uh, important thing because you can't necessarily see impact you, you can see it over time. Um, and I think the longevity of connection and relationship is critically important. Next slide, please. Just very quickly, it's a very wordy slide, but I just wanted to reinforce that I have th there are three main objectives, really. One, it's about how do we use our trade as a lever to forward positive social change? How do we um, look at supporting those community-based businesses and people uh, through trade? So it's always about people, for people, by people, if you like. Um, the next one is clearly talking about holistic respect for the environment in the scope of the materials that we're working with. And regenerative practices are now much more in the forefront of, of people's thinking um, in terms of how we reforest, we improve soil health, but also social regeneration, I think, is a really important part of the regenerative agenda. Um, and I think it should be um, uh, highlighted a lot more. And the third part is why I'm one of the reasons I'm here today from an uh, activist brand um, and a feminist brand to talk to other businesses and say you know there are better purchasing models out there there are there are better ways of doing business um, and there are forums like this and connectivities that you can make to help you on that journey because I understand the complexity of it you may not have a team of people that can get involved with social enterprises um, but there are other lots of networks and communities out there that can support that next slide please
And maybe this slide doesn't look the most uh, glamorous, but actually maybe it carries some of the biggest message. So trade, as I've mentioned before, is really at the heart of it. It's not a philanthropic program. This is why we talk about business as a force for good. Um, it's about trade. Trade is the vehicle that allows everything else to happen. We, as our own program, we bring a, a, a lot of added elements to that relationship. We call it targeted support. So whatever that business um, needs to become sustainable, we bring that. So um, I might sit with a group and we talk about improving crop yields, uh, look at reduced waste to increase um, uh, efficiency, therefore increase livelihood. Whatever it is that they need, we can either bring that directly as people from the body shop or we have massive global networks of INGOs, local NGOs, governments, um, and other businesses. So it's, it's, a, it's a full sort of holistic view of helping those organizations flourish. This in turn creates opportunity, maybe the most important word here and little underused, but I think opportunity for people to access decent meaningful work opportunity for them to have their kids um, attend uh, decent educational facilities um, and good health care, outreach support services, whatever that may look like. So actually, and in my experience, what I've always seen is that when people are afforded opportunity, they do bloody amazing things with it. It humbles me and inspires me all the time. And these things together is what creates impact. Next slide, please. So one of my favorite photographs, I absolutely love this photograph, is some of the women in our community fair trade partner in northern Ghana, um, the Tungtea Women's Association, um, and they make shea butter. Um, shea butter is one of our staple ingredients. I think we were one of the first beauty companies to ever put it in a product um, and uh, for, since, since the early 90s. And, um, but what do you see here? I tell you, I see many things here, and I can tell you many stories on behalf of the women and the communities. But what I see is women in business. I see business women, I see business leaders. Um, and I think this is a really important part to, to talk about because that's what I talk about when we talk about community fair trade and supporting local business. This is what it looks like for me. And I just wanted to pull out a couple of things that come through when we talk about that impact. So on the people's side, yeah, self-esteem, um, you know, livelihood creation, the respect they now hold within the wider communities because the fact that they are um, become more educated and trained in business matters and earnings. But that business thing is really important. On the planet side, the people that we work with around the world, they're at the forefront of impacts of climate change. They're going to be the people that see and are affected by it first, but they're also at the front line of protection. So how can we help them and them help us in terms of looking at issues around climate resilience? This is going to be really, really important. Again, with regenerative practices as well and biodiversity, um, our partners are going to play an absolutely key role in this. And that wider impact, you know, the groups become philanthropical in their communities. So it's the groups that take their profits, it's the premium fund on top of the fair price, they start to build schools, they start to do trainings, whatever it is that the wider communities and the stakeholders believe is important for them. Um, and so, yes, my group and my team is responsible for looking at the sustainability of the community initiatives too, but it's a really important part to understand that we, through trade, support businesses and the businesses in turn, following sort of our shared values and mission, provide philanthropical um, outlets to support growth in, in communities. And we've now got hundreds of thousands of people that are benefiting from those programs that our partners are running in country. Um, and that, uh, next slide, please. And I think that that's the end of, um, yep, that's the end of mine. Just a picture there, actually really interesting of, of how we've taken all of this learning over 35 years and become really quite maverick and I'm quite a big fan of being disruptive and in taking it into looking at new ways of doing things and so we launched um, a couple of years ago now the world's first ever fairly traded recycled plastics, working with truly marginalized groups of women um, as waste pickers in, in Southern India. And this program itself um, has gone on to win multiple awards and we're putting it back into our product packaging. Um, and the social impact there is, is truly incredible.
So that's a little bit about um, the Body Shop work and what we mean by um, business as a force for good and how we work within our community fair trade program. Um, thanks for listening. I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, actually, Natalie in Avon, who's going to talk to you next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. Such an inspiring presentation. And I, whenever my colleagues at the Body Shop share quotes from Anita, Anita Roddick, I'm just uh, kind of covered in goosebumps at how far ahead of her time she was. And they are as an organisation. So terrific. Um, I'm Natalie. I head up Corporate Affairs and Sustainability at Avon. I'm going to share a short video now to break it up to introduce Avon, and then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about the role of business as a force for good. You think you know me? You think you know what I'm made of? Go ahead, underestimate me. Put me to the test. Try me. You'll see my true colours. I am a pioneer of beauty and care. Born 135 years ago to stand by, for, and with women. And I'm only just getting started. I am five million strong representatives around the world and counting. I am her, them, and you. I am a thousand patents in beauty and skincare products. The best selling fragrances in the world. Three lipsticks sold every second. One billion dollars donated to causes that keep women safe, healthy, and financially independent. I am affordable, quality beauty for everyone. I am here to help you see and own your potential. To tell your story and celebrate your journey. I'm the one you didn't see coming. And now, you can't look away. Avon, watch me now. So that's a little bit about Avon. And I'm going to talk and build on this idea of the opportunity that we all have to, to rebuild a more inclusive, equal world. And you might recognize the header to this slide as a, a quote that's been used a lot over the last 12 months from Antonio Guterres, the, the UN Secretary General, that we have this window of opportunity to rebuild better. So there are two sides to this coin. On the one hand, we have seen the pandemic worsen inequality, we've seen the gap between rich and poor widen, we've seen the most vulnerable, most disadvantaged parts of our world be those that are disproportionately further disadvantaged by the impact of the pandemic. We've seen the gender gap go from a century to around about 135 years. Um, so in many ways you could say that the coronavirus has been a disaster for equality. However, I also like this headline from the Independent in the, the bottom right hand corner that actually this is a moment where a greener and a more equal economy must emerge after the impact of the pandemic. And I think we are now at a fundamental reshaping of the role of business and the opportunity for the beauty industry to, to play a role in that as a force for good. So on the next slide, I would just say that this has been building for a while, this fundamental um, reshaping. And uh, that's actually a quote from Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, and many of you will be aware of um, the rhetoric and the open letters from um, Larry, uh, Larry Fink, who is CEO of BlackRock. They are the biggest investment bank in the world who have talked about a fundamental reshaping of finance and said that they will now only be investing in companies that look at the triple bottom line, not just profit, but people and planet. And Colin Mayer wrote several years ago that we've moved away from the old model of the purpose of business being to generate profits for shareholders to the role of business as a force for good in the world. And we have such an opportunity moment right now. And we in the beauty industry 
have such an important part to play in being part of that change, particularly when it comes to equality and inclusion. And you'll see on the next slide, um, it's been terrific to see the greater representation in our industry over the last few years. So whether it's more hair or skin ranges, but non-white skin, whether it's the inclusion of a much more diverse set of role models and ambassadors um, showcasing our industry. This is a really, really important shift to normalize to a much more diverse range of images. This really, you know, this is a selection of a from Avon, but this really shows how we're setting the tone as a beauty industry to change and shape perceptions of what is beautiful and what is aspirational. And that's really important on the pathway to equality and greater cultural inclusion. And we're seeing this really measure, measured, or well, sorry, mirrored in how businesses are run. We're seeing much more diversity at every level of the business. While where organizations are looking to drive out groupthink, where they're looking to encourage much more creativity, because we know that businesses that have greater diversity, that have greater equality, perform better. You know, it's as simple as that. And you know, there's the old adage that what gets measured gets, ma gets managed. And it is really important to measure some of these diversity metrics and equality metrics because if your data shows and it most probably will that there's a lack of diversity and a lack of equality in terms of pay in terms of seniority then that gives you something to work towards at avon we have 50 50 gender split at a senior level we're aiming for a 30% inclusion of underrepresented groups, but we're all on a journey here. And um, we've talked quite a lot today about communities outside of the UK, but I think it's still worth remembering that here in the UK, we tend to sometimes think that we have done gender, that, that we're equal, um, but actually we've still got a gender pay gap of 30%. Um, and that's not to mention the Peter problem. So if you're not familiar with the Peter problem, there are more male CEOs in the FTSE 250 with the name Peter than there are women. It's not a problem that is confined to the UK. In the, in the US, I think it's a John problem, but you get the idea. So tracking the numbers is really important to shine a light on the issues that we want to address. At Avon, we're all about creating opportunities for anyone and everyone to earn and learn. And you, you heard um, Peter and Halbert at the start talk about the importance of creating opportunities. So Avon was founded on this premise of removing barriers for economic participation and entrepreneurship. So anybody, anywhere can become an Avon beauty business owner, set up their own business. So back in 1886, when um, Avon was first founded. This was three decades before women had the right to vote. It was a really disruptive business model, this idea of women who couldn't vote, only about 20% of whom worked outside of the home in paid employment, becoming beauty entrepreneurs, selling to friends and family through their social networks. Um, so if you think about it, it was, it still is an incredibly disruptive business model. And our, our representatives earn at least 20% commission on everything they make. You know, that's a much greater return in terms of percentages than our shareholders make on a monthly basis. Um, but 30, 135 years on, equality of opportunity is still a burning platform. So we're really proudly democratic and inclusive and, and open to all. And with 5 million representatives across the world, yet all of whom are beauty entrepreneurs in their own right, we really see firsthand the power that creating an opportunity can create and the ripple effect that meaningful, decent, paid work for an individual can have on both the individual and the communities around them. I, you know, I think, as Lee said, people can do bloody amazing things when you give them an opportunity. So on the next slide, I just wanted to build on this point. And we've seen some amazing images today 
that really challenge what it is to be an entrepreneur, what it is to lead the way in our industry when it comes to redefining and breaking out of the mold. You know, if you Google image search on entrepreneur, there's still a lot of men, uh, and a fair few women, uh, mostly in suits, a lot of algebra and light bulbs going on behind them. But this is the face of modern entrepreneurship. The images you've seen over the last hour is the face of modern entrepreneurship. And we need to make sure that we're doing all we can to create opportunities. So these are just a handful of the women in our network. You know, we have 5 million representatives, 95% of whom um, identify as women. And they've each got their own story, you know, whether it's Valentia from South Africa, um, who was able to rebuild her life following an abusive relationship, whether it's Debbie from um, the UK, who was unemployed, couldn't pay her rent after losing her job in a factory and you know, is now hunkering down in her very nice um, four bedroom detached house um, up in Cheshire. You know, this is, you know, we're lucky enough to see firsthand the ripple effect that empowering one person can have and equalizing opportunity and creating opportunity for one person has this positive impact on not just themselves, but their family, their community, and ultimately the world. And that really speaks to the power of individual action, which ultimately adds up to the power of the collective. And on my, my last slide, my closing thought would be that um, it, we at Avon, we sell through a, a specific model, which is all about creating self-employed entrepreneurs, but we can all take steps to help to create opportunities for people to help to close that equality gap. And um, I don't think I've ever quoted Jack Johnson in a presentation before, but uh, I really loved this idea of an individual action multiplied by millions can create global change. So I think it's really spot on that as individuals or us as a beauty industry, we really have the power to create positive change. And on that note, I'm delighted to hand over to a very inspiring woman who is a great example of an individual who is driving change and creating that ripple effect on those around them. So I'm going to hand over to Jo Chidley. Thank you. Thanks very much, Natalie, for that beautiful introduction. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jo Chidley, and I'm the co-founder of Beauty Kitchen and Return, Refill, Repeat. I'm here today to talk to you about the importance of entrepreneurial spirit, collaboration as a business and as an industry. And that's where the real change will happen to be more socially responsible. So next slide, please. There is only one planet Earth, yet by 2050, the world will be consuming as if there is three. Global consumption of materials such as biomass, fossil fuels, metals, and minerals is expected to double in the next 40 years. While annual waste generation is projected to increase by 70%, social responsibility can help us make the changes necessary in the way that we consume things. The magnitude is in part due to the quantity of the things that we buy. Therefore, we need a systems-wide change that enables us all to choose more sustainable ways to live, use the things we need and share resources. This is what's known as the circular economy. And it's something we know is a solution in tackling the many problems that we face from social fairness, climate change, to our own race to net zero. And as a business, Beauty Kitchen exists to pioneer change within our business, but within the wider industry. And we want to create sustainable advantage for everyone. Our unique approach brings technology, consumer engagement, and what we try to do is remove the barriers to change to enable brands, retailers, and I'm now calling consumer citizens because we all have a social responsibility to participate. So a couple of stats for you, just to bring to mind some of the issues that we have. 
Plastic in 1950 was 2 million tonnes, in 2020, 380 million, but by 2030, that number is set to treble. Now, in my head, and this is a quote from an environmental hero of mine, if it can't be reduced, reused, repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, refinished, resold, recycled, or composted, then it should be restricted, designed, or removed for production. And that's what really interests me here, and I know everyone's touched on it. We want millions of people to be doing sustainability imperfectly, not a handful of people doing it perfectly. It's about progress and moving the dial. And we have to keep in mind that there is no such thing as a way. When we throw anything away, it must go somewhere. And that's where social responsibility really plays a part because generally it goes outside of our country. And we're also reusing less than before. We know that the linear economy is obsolete and yet we're all still a part of it. Recycling is ultimately downcycling and circular economy is the solution. So how does that work here at Beauty Kitchen? And what has that really got to do with being socially responsible? For us, we have two models for reusable packaging as a refill in store, which engages and communicates with reuse and prefill, which basically replaces single use packaging with reusable packaging. So basically there's no additional space if that's a bricks and mortar store or in a warehouse. We also have the data that reuse creates less greenhouse gas emissions than single use packaging. Reuse also creates the right jobs that are socially fair, that are local to where each facility is, but it can also bring large scale change and that's why it's socially responsible. So, so this is a busy slide, I'm not going to read it all, but social responsibility covers many areas and you have to decide where your business wants to focus in on. At Beauty Kitchen, social responsibility includes philanthropy, volunteering and the environment. So for instance, we use an ethical supply code of conduct. This ensures that everyone in our supply chain has social fairness. For example, real living wages are paid, employment is freely chosen, work hours are not excessive, and there's no discrimination. And we enforce this through third party verification marks, which I will come on to. In terms of looking at things like child labour that isn't used, there's no bribery or con corruption will be tolerated. This all sits within the supply chain and our code of conduct. But it also means that our environmental policies and philanthropy are key in supporting the overall vision of social responsibility. And we do this in a variety of different ways, whether that's 2% of our overall sales that goes to charities, from the pro bono work that myself and my team do, to each employee giving four um, day employee days to the charity of their choice. We believe that people, planet and profit, where profit can be many things, not just the bottom line. And again, people have talked about the triple bottom line. So we, this is how we make this happen. Through setting our own standards, thinking about all aspects of our business and every human touch point, we want to set a new standards on how products are measured and how they impact for good and to the benefit of everyone. But for us, we could say that we are doing that as a business. We feel really strongly about being independently verified. And we do that through third party verification marks, which are B Corp and Cradle to Cradle. To show this, B Corp is a multi attribute certification to promote the highest social and environmental responsibility through their scoring system. When we first certified, our score was 89.3. When we recertified this year, it was 139.8. We are the highest scoring um, personal care B Corp in Europe. And we also received the best in the world B Corp for community for our highest level in scoring and social responsibility because it's not just about us and our employees, it's about the wider supply chain and finding ways of being transparent and understanding the impact our business and manufacturing processes have. 
And then that leads into how we design our products. And the way that we do that is that we created, for instance, our seahorse plankton range, which is cradle to cradle certified at platinum for social fairness. That gives a verification needed to understand when we've developed that product range, we've developed it for the circular economy, which social fairness and social responsibility is a main pillar of. And we're proud to be recognised as the winner of the 2021 CW Responsible Beauty Awards. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I hope everybody watching this is as inspired as I am. <laughs> um, and it's very interesting to watch the flow of these presentations, how they set us off on these beautiful journeys. Um, and I think you heard a lot of beautiful journeys along the way. So coming out of adversity and difficult situations, you can see that the solutions um, are really um, are beautiful and, and happy, in fact. So we do actually have a couple of questions. Uh, one is for Helen specifically, and I think the other one will probably be more suited to Joe. Um, so Helen, um, and, and if you want to answer afterwards, and if anybody has any other questions, they can divert them through the CEW and we can get them to our panelists. But whilst we have time, because we finished beautifully on time to allow us 20 minutes for questions, um, Helen, one of the uh, attendees has asked, what is the best way for brands to get involved with the Satari camp and what would be their most urgent needs? If you have any thoughts on that. Mm. So the, the best model of being able to work with a camp is to connect to, um, uh, to have a relationship with an NGO who has a, has a community enabling role within the camp. Um, this is so that you don't go in and... Uh, with, you, with, with our great ideas and do damage. <laughs> um, so the, the partnership needs to be in place. In terms of the needs, they are different for men, they're different for women, they're different for children, they're different for the elderly and the disabled. Um, for the communities that I work with, for the women in terms of making, uh, their biggest challenges at the moment are the nature of what they make getting to markets. Um, and then the payment methods that, which have to fall within Jordanian law uh, so that the money that their products can make can be find their way back in directly into the hands of the refugees. And Anne and I have been working uh, quite long and hard on exploring different methods of being able to do that. Um, we also, I think, haven't finally got to what the sustainable model is going to be in terms of uh, the women's uh, making products in the camp. So that's still there for the for the sort of development. Um, the Tiger Girls, uh, they're also now Tiger Boys, or they don't like being called the Tiger Boys. They've got their own, I think they're called the Back Boys, Boys with Action or something. Um, I think what they want is their voices to be heard in the world. Um, I think what they also welcome is um, projects and ideas that allow their imaginations to find new places. Um, and I think also there's a need for role models, particularly with young girls, to go back to the original initiative for the Tigers, which is to show parents that there is an alternative way for young girls to lead their lives other than early marriage. So uh, um, there's lots more detail, but I hope that sort of encapsulates some of that. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. So we have uh, two questions who are uh, following the sort of a similar line. Um, one is, as a small business with limited resources, how can we make the biggest impact? Where should we be focusing as a priority, in your opinion? And the similar question, I think we all want to become more socially responsible. Can you advise on the best first step to take? Anybody want to take that on? I think maybe go and uh, sign up with Avon possibly. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't mind having the first stab with regards to a small business. We are a small SME. And the first step really is to look at your own operations and set the standard within your own operations to then amplify that out into other organizations. So at Beauty Kitchen, we very much in the early days focused in on what we could influence in our circle of influence, if you like, by paying the real living wage, for instance, for our own employees, having equal benefits. It didn't matter which job you were in within Beauty Kitchen and setting those standards. I think that's always the, the best place to start. When you then want to influence others, 
that's when big business can come into play. So I've always wanted to drive the innovation outwards from Beauty Kitchen because much larger organisations are slower to move, yet but younger and smaller organisations can help them do that. So facilitate that communication, collaborate openly with them. It will be challenging um, and there's always obstacles to overcome, but I believe that that then makes you stronger as a smaller growing business. And then the last thing is having your, you know, code of conduct, you know, your supplier code of conduct will help to um, give you guidance on some of the main things that mean to be more socially responsible. So for me, child labour is huge down a supply chain outside of the UK. So it has to be in your code of conduct that you will refuse you know, to um, engage with that, whatever your code of conduct is in your eyes to be socially responsible. Well, maybe I can just build on that then, because actually I believe quite strongly in a lot of what Joe's just said, and I think it's really important that you understand your business model really. First of all, it's it, it, if you're a manufacturer, maybe you should be concentrating on your manufacturing impacts. If you're a buyer of something, what does it look like in your supply chain? But also connecting all of those three things together, educating consumers on your way of working and your beliefs is really important too because you want the consumer to come on that journey and hopefully make changes in their own lifestyle as well but I think one of the biggest things is if you want to focus on areas you have to start with what you're passionate about you know there's no point in my opinion being a business saying that we're going to focus on reforestation efforts if you hate everything to do with forests you're just never going to do it. Um, so what are you passionate about? Which part of that do you really want to drive and make that the keystone of, of your efforts? And of course, you need to be a bit broad, like Joe's just said, and lots of other things to be aware of. But I think you have to start with passion. So what are you passionate about? That will actually give you the impetus to, to succeed in those areas. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I echo everything that's just been said, particularly about how smaller organisations can be a little bit more agile. And yeah, and I think that there are a couple of places to start. One is do what we in bigger organisations would call a materiality review. Ask your customers, ask your teams what they care about. Um, look at the UN sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals. You know, that, that's a really great starting point. Match those two together and pick out one or two bits to get started on. I can, um, I can add one element on top of all the great inputs. Is that many, in many cases, we, uh, we all do great things without noticing because we are doing it all the time. That's the definition of best practice. You need someone else to look at you and say, oh, but what you're doing is best practice. And you're just saying, yeah, it's common sense. But what is maybe common sense to you may not be common sense to others. So involve other people, you know, for your surrounding business uh, ecosystem. Uh, share, you know, what you're doing openly and in a very candid manner. And you'll be surprised how many good things you're doing without even noticing. And it always starts uh, there, recognizing and acknowledging that many things already happen very well because your company exists. So there must be some good reasons and good uh, things done in the background. Thank you, thank you. And I just wanted to add one thing. Um, a few years ago when we did our the sem seminar on sustainability, my colleague, Juliet Fairclough, she showed the United Nations sustainability uh, goals. Thanks, Natalie, for mentioning that. Um, but it came through in what, what you're all saying because everybody had this thing about, oh my God, how do I do sustainability in my business? I'm small, what can I do? And it's very much about tackling what you can do and breaking it down into bite-sized pieces and every little bit that you can do don't try and do all the big things as uh, Lee said don't go and try and do something you're not passionate about do what you can do and when you add it all together you know it will all have an impact with everything else so you're all on the same sort of line so thank you very much uh, we have one more question um, and I think it's a similar vein so um, it says can you share the biggest hurdles and challenges have been and what the biggest hurdles and challenges have been as businesses? Anybody? <laughs> so I'm going to take that first. Um, so the, the world of business is built on a linear economy model, and we know that it is obsolete. 
But because we're all entrenched in that, it seems really distant about how do we how do we change what everything is built on? And I think it's about just changing your mindset in the first place. So if you're one individual, you're the beginning of a community. If you change your mindset, you then gather like-minded people around you from a variety of different ways, which helps to gather that momentum. And I think that for me is key around, you know, finding your tribe of what that is, which comes back to Lee's point about being passionate about something that, that you're truly passionate about. I would say, um, whilst this isn't an issue for us personally in, and for me personally in Avon, one of the biggest challenges can simply be around unlocking resources and unlocking buy-in from your organisation. Um, and yet we're, we're in a different place now to where we were five years ago, even in recognition of business that we all need to be building resilient, responsible organisations. But I think there are still uh, organisations and individuals out there that need to be convinced. And I think there's a danger sometimes when there are people like us who are really passionate about these issues together that we're already preaching to the converted. And I think you know, there's both a moral and an economic argument here. And I think it's really important that we always bring both of those together when we're trying to engage others in the business around us. I would, uh, I would really highlight this, the importance of being vocal and never put um, success and sustainability in an antagonist manner. They go together. It, uh, a sustainable, successful business is what sustainability means for business. And it's absolutely fine to, um, uh, to encounter people that may say that it's one way or the other. No, reality is that we need to have a platform to talk openly about this removing any anxiety about what needs to be done, what can be done, just engage everyone because the passion of uh, everyone around the, the companies are just enormous when we are, we find a sweet spot about what successful sustainable business means to them, means to their department and means to uh, the company. It's the power of collective intelligence. It's just unbelievably powerful. I, I think, um, you know, even within our organization, we've been doing this for a very long time as we've established, but, you know, creatively balancing that uncomfortable bedfellows between responsible actions and commercial realities is is always a challenge you know when I have to go to the chief financial officer of the body shop and say oh I want to do this amazing thing um but by the way it's going to cost more you know it's how, how do you get people on board with those sorts of arguments now I'm not saying all sustainability shifts cost more some don't some cost less in fact and I think I don't want anyone to ever think that fair trade always costs more than normal trade because that's not the reality of the of the situation at all um, but one of the things I've done is I've reframed the conversation so what I've talked about now is I I stop talking about cost and price and I talk about value you know what is the value of something versus what's it going to cost right now of course we still have to get down to the nitty-gritty of what it's going to cost but reframing the conversation just allows people to actually start to listen a bit more and become more engaged in those things. And I think one of the initiatives that the body shop took, which some people may be aghast in, but we link for every single staff member that's um, applicable for bonus, we linked a sustainability target to some of the work that we were doing under the community fair trade program. So as a company, if we didn't achieve that target, then everyone's performance bonus was uh, affected by that. And I've not really seen that in many organizations, but I think that's a great way from your CEO down all across the business to engage people in those journeys. Um, so that's some of, the, uh, some of the, the ways I think reframe the conversation internally. Thank you. Uh, is that all from our panelists? Anybody else want to say anything else before we close? Okay, so um, I will hand over to Sally in a minute, but there were just two things that I wanted, to, three things I want to say. I want to thank all our panellists. Um, they know it's been a pleasure working with them. I hope you've really enjoyed their stories. Uh, when you registered for this seminar, this webinar, you should have received a soap, which was produced on the Satari uh, in, project in Jordan. If you haven't they will be sent to you. Maybe they just didn't get you in time, but I think it's the most wonderful example of what is possible. Uh, 
And the other thing I just wanted to refer to as sponsors of the Responsible Beauty Award, for those that didn't hear when we announced it two weeks ago, uh, for this year's award, there will actually be two awards. There will be an overall excellence award, and then there will be an innovation award. And I'm mentioning this because this innovation could be in any direction. It could be packaging, but it could be social responsibility. It could something really major that you're doing with your product and your company and social responsibility. So think about that. Um, the application forms will be coming around again soon. <laughs> it seems to move very fast this year. Um, so thank you all for attending. And now um, I shall hand over to Sally to close this webinar. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Well, I think I would just echo um, you, Maxine, really, and just thanking everybody for your time today. What an amazing lineup, what an inspiring examples of business and enterprise being a force for good. And so thank you so much for highlighting all, you know, the importance of opportunities. I think to your opening point, Maxine, certainly this will definitely have sparked at least one idea for everyone who's attended today. I know I've written down several on my pad of paper here um, to think about opportunities that they might wish to create in their own businesses. CW is a really powerful network of businesses and a community of people. And it really has been an honor to open up the platform today again to showcase all of the different businesses and opportunities and initiatives from the industry. And I agree, I think with all of you, I think at some point said that collaboration is absolutely essential if we're gonna make change. And I think we all agree overwhelmingly that the time to do that is now. So I very much hope that we'll be able to work again um, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you, Jivadan, for curating the session today. We will provide information, a synopsis on all of the speaker topics in the coming days for everybody who signed up. Uh, soaps, as, as, as Maxine said, they're beautiful. So if you, yours hasn't arrived yet, don't panic, it will. Um, and if you do have any questions, please just get in touch with us and, and we'll be happy to send those on to the speakers. Um, the Responsible Beauty Award entries will open um, in November, I guess. The team are gonna kill me for saying that now, but it's great that we're expanding the award. It's going from strength to strength. We'd love to add 10 categories to it if we can, but that'd be a really long application form. So next year it's two, let's see what happens the year after that. Uh, but for now, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, all of the speakers and for everybody who joined us. Um, we'll say goodbye until the next time. Thank you.